So, warmly welcome. It's good morning and good day and good afternoon and good evening because we have such a rich variety over the globe uh, with participants. Uh, we wanted to check in with, well, you have already started put where you are, but uh, where, what are you bringing into this meeting today? Please write that in the chat. Maybe you have a question or a feeling or a reason for being here. Yeah, I feel really curious. Yeah, me too. Curious and, and excited. Uh, really looking forward to this. Uh, the uh, main, main participants uh, today are a, a very interesting trio. I'm so really looking forward to hear that, but also looking forward to see your reflections and reactions in the chat. But maybe we should say something who we are. Yes, my yeah. name is Fatima Bukhari. Yeah, and I'm Johan Holm. And with us, we also have Jesper, who is on tech support. Can you say hi, Jesper? Maybe you, you're, you'll yeah. pop up. If there we, you are. I'm here. Them. Yes, there's Jesper. And we also have Lotta uh, on the team who's here also. Are you somewhere hi, here, Lotta? Good hi, to Lotta. see you. Good to yeah. be together. Yeah, great. Yeah, so we're the gatherings teams who organize these gatherings uh, monthly. Yes, and these gatherings, we have a series, have had a series of gatherings, and I'm sure many of you have participated in them. Uh, we started with these last year after the summit that we had one year ago, and uh, we've covered topics as uh, psychological safety with uh, Amy Edmondson. Uh, we have listened to um, one of the most recent ones was uh, when we listened to uh, yes, Native yes. American sharing yes. her view on, yeah. on reality yes, and the world. I need my glasses, but you need to go on. And uh, let's see that if we can around. mute there. Yes, Bert, can you help out with that? Good. So, and we, um, uh, and we also had uh, one gathering where we listened to 29K and how we can use uh, digital technology to develop personally and individually through our phones mainly. And I saw Frederick, you're here also, which is mm -hmm. nice. And uh, we've also worked with our shadow sides and we've listened to adult development. So there have been different themes uh, on these gatherings. And our intention with these gatherings is to deepen understanding of some of the perspectives that are behind the inner development goals. Um, and uh, uh, as many of you might know, there was a big gathering on April 29th. I guess many of you were there uh, where we were about 4,500 people participating uh, a big event on the IDG or Inner Development Goals Summit. Yes, and today it's very exciting because we're going to dive into uh, system theory. So we have invited a nice uh, threesome of uh, very interesting speakers who will dive into this. And I think I will uh, leave the word to you, Rene, who was one of our speakers at the summit the 29th of April. And uh, she's also an advisor and a friend of the IGGs. Hi, hello everyone. Um, it's early Hi. morning where I am. I'm based south of San Francisco in Silicon Valley in the woods here in Woodside, California. Um, <clears throat> and really looking forward to this conversation with um, this community and two of my favorite people. Um, so I, um, I'm a psychologist and I've been focusing on the intersection of psychology, climate, sustainability for about 30 decades now. And what I do presently is I, I work with organizations and leaders and leadership teams within organizations around what are the capabilities that we need as humans to meet the uh, ever evolving complex challenges uh, that we're contending with. And I'm incredibly inspired. If any of you saw the talk at the summit, I, I, I acknowledged um, how profound this movement is. And uh, it's nascent. And I'm honored to be kind of getting in pretty early, um, as we all are, in kind of this, this development of this work. So that's me. Um, I'm going to now turn it over to my 
um, colleague, uh, Michael Bacher, uh, who's joining us to say a few words about who you are. Hey, everybody, or happy Wednesday. I think it's Wednesday or Thursday, but for this. Uh, Michael Bacher, you find me here in SUNY, Sunnyville in California, south of San Francisco. And I actually lead a variety of workplace programs at Google. So if you think about food at work, transportation, health and performance, helpful at home, as well as the sustainability program for the real estate and workplace services team for Google overall. So the programs I get involved with truly enable our workforce to thrive but in a rapidly changing global environment. So I'm excited to speak today with Peter and with Renee to learn more about what can be done. How can we enable a global workforce to get ready for a very dynamic future? With that, I'm going to hand it over to Peter. Oh, you're muted. Finger. Unfortunately, my fingers are a little slower than my mouth. I have to work on that. <laughs> Um, so um, I'm glad, delighted to join you all. Um, nice to be part of this program with Michael and Renee. Um, I've been part of the IDG journey uh, for a long time. I, I, I don't think I can say since it started, because I don't know exactly when it started. But I'll say a few more words about what that's meant to me in a few minutes. But I'm really happy to join you this morning. Uh, my name is Peter Senge. I'm based at MIT. Uh, and been for a long time and kind of been doing this systems thinking stuff for a long time. So we'll, we'll get back to all that, but it's really nice to see you all. I'm, just, I'm really happy to be part of this session today. Great, thank you. So I wanna orient us to the uh, format for the session and then we'll dive right in. So um, this is a conversation. And so we're taking a conversational spirit here. Um, and I acknowledge there's a lot of curiosity in the room, including amongst the three of us. And so we're going to be really having uh, exploring kind of what themes come up. So we're going to start with Peter uh, and we're going to um, be hearing some reflections from Peter for, you know, for a bit of time. And then um, Michael and I are going to jump in, respond, reflect to what's been shared. And then the three of us are going to have a conversation to see again what's emerging. And then we're going to uh, invite us into some brief breakouts and we'll set that up uh, closer to the time um, where everyone has the opportunity to just check in with each other on kind of what's surfacing. And then, you know, that that we'll have an opportunity to kind of share from the larger group what might have come up and then we'll close for the session. So that's that's how we're approaching this. So with that. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to you, Peter. Great, thank you. Uh, so let me say a few more words about the inner development goals, um, which I have to say right at the beginning, I, I consider a little bit of an oxymoron. You'll, uh, you'll understand the meaning of that, of that statement in a minute. Um, but uh, we've all watched the emergence of the sustainable development goals, the SDGs, now over the last uh, uh, six, seven, eight years. Um, and speaking as uh, someone who lives in the United States, I think it's probably one of the countries that gives the least attention to it. Uh, I find around the world, almost everybody knows the SDGs. I ask most people in the United States, they've never heard of the SDGs. And, and the problem there is in part, of course, the inherited and antipathy amongst uh, a lot of the American culture, American society towards the United Nations and all of this kind of global stuff, meaning you can't tell us what to do. <laughs> it's kind of, I think, the way a lot of Americans see it. And, and so on the other hand, I think for many people in the world, the development of the SDGs is a seminal one. You know, for the first time, we, the people living on this planet, are trying to put stakes in the ground about what we really need to accomplish together so that we can feel more of a sense of confidence about our future. Um, probably most of you know this very well, stress, anxiety, depression, suicide rates are growing around the world and have been for, for several decades. Uh, 
over the last 10 years, suicide rates amongst uh, young people in the United States have increased by a factor of two, 100%. That's before COVID. And it's fair to say, and I think talking about young people is always a good window into this because kids and young people are a little more transparent. You know, what they say and what they do tend to align a little more than we often as adults have learned to be more, uh, uh, I'll, I'll use a negative word, deceitful. I think that's an accurate term. Uh, kids are not like that. Uh, and the concern of young people about the future is really an epidemic. There was a recent study actually published in Nature of all places, the kind of eminent physics journal uh, uh, of 10,000 young people from around the world talking about their anxiety for the future. So against that backdrop, for the world to start to come together and say, no, these are things we really want to achieve that would represent a healthy future is a very significant development, notwithstanding the uh, kind of indifference or disregard in my own country, I think for the world as a whole, people are really kind of rooting for the SDGs, hoping that this maybe can really make a difference. I think in that context, the development of the IDGs is really important, the inner development goals. Uh, because I don't know, I can only speak for myself. When I first started to see the sustainable development goals, I will admit, I too felt a sense of kind of skepticism and even cynicism. Well, it's really easy to set out these goals. So what, you have goals. Do you have anything approaching the wherewithal to actually make progress towards these goals? Or is it just a kind of a, a, a psychological salve, you know, a way to feel better because we put these goals out there, even though we have no realistic hope of making progress towards them? I think the interdevelopment goals in an interesting way represent a response to that. So for me, what that means is that the sustainable development goals make a lot of sense, but they basically represent a big shift from the status quo. You could say a 180 degree turn. You know, we've been moving as a global society for well over a century, you could even say a couple centuries towards a very materialistic view, towards it's all about GDP growth, nothing else really matters, um, that income and spending for me as an individual is like the def definition of the good life. If I make enough money that I can buy enough things, I, I don't need to belabor this. So to now start to say, no, um, we really have some aspirations, some deep longing for our ability to be, you know, the first of the inner development goals, being, for our ability to relate, to be with one another, to live in a world where we feel supported, seen, and in turn, we see and support those around us, to work together towards things we really care about, um, and, and to learn to think in a new way. We'll kind of loop back to that and act in service of these kind of goals. Uh, to me, it's like, maybe, maybe this is the beginning of reversing the confusion. I do, I do regard the industrial age, which we're still in the middle of, as an age of profound confusion. Yes, of course, material uh, well-being is important up to a certain point. And after that, it's like, chasing your tail, right? It's like more and more for the sake of more and more, not because it's better in any sense. Um, and we all know that. And we all look at the bizarre concentration of wealth, which is, if anything, of course, accelerating right now um, as, as really a minor, kind of a testament to our confusion that a handful of people, mostly white men, would own or have as much private wealth as um, half the world is, is really bizarre. It's the only word you can use. So these are all to me illustrations of a profound confusion, uh, kind of an infection of confusion that's gradually permeated all the world's societies because the global industrialization process has been just that global over the last uh, really five to 10 to 15 decades. And, and the interdevelopment goals are beginning of a process at a, at a large scale, 
because obviously that's what makes them potentially meaningful. Could we as a people of the planet Earth start to accept that, no, no, really, our ability to be really matters. What does it mean to just be present? To just be where I am, to notice what's around me, to be at peace or in a state of rest or relaxation, regardless of what's going on. You know, to be a great athlete or to be a great performer in any field, you have to learn to do what you're doing in a state of real relaxation. And it's not relaxation like I'm lying on the couch, but it's presence. It's simply being able to allow this particular system, this organism to function at its best, which does not happen in a state of fear or anxiety. Fear contracts imagination, anxiety contracts muscle groups all around. We all know these things. So it's, I see the inner development goals as a beginning of a step stage of maybe we can start to reorient ourselves around what we know ultimately really matters for our real sense of well-being and happiness. Now, my comment at the outset, inner development goals is to me a little bit of an oxymoron, is really reflecting on the word goal. So why do I think this is, could be important, not just because it's kind of reversing the confusion, but also because um, I don't think you can actually achieve inner development goals like you could achieve the goal of walking across the room. Part of our kind of materialistic um, industrial age is becoming very goal oriented. I'm, I'm not against goals. I think goals are great and it's really fun. But you know, life is a lot more complex than just the linear pursuit of moving from point A to point B. We do not raise our children simply by having a goal. We have to deal with the realities moment by moment of what's going on with them. I'm using this just now to illustrate. The things that really matter to us in our lives, our own well-being, our well-being of our families, the, the quality of relationships around us, the sense of peace and ease in my community, the safety where I live, Yes, we can set goals, but the process of getting from here to there is not a you know, linear progression. It's characterized by having an intention. The intention really matters, don't misunderstand me, but also really paying attention to what is and allowing a more kind of circuitous uh, evolving path. Goal-directed behavior can kind of be blind to emergence, blind to serendipity, blind to new developments that we would have never thought of, but in many ways are in line with what we care deeply about. This is interestingly, you know, a kind of a core understanding in the entrepreneurial world. Yeah, you have a target. Yeah, you have a plan, but the plan is to get you oriented. It's not because you expect to follow the plan literally, and it's to give you a way of checking how you're doing. That's all fine. But a lot of the most important developments you can never predict. You might've had something to do with it. You might've had little to do with it. It might just be serendipitous circumstance. How you recognize that and move with it in pursuit of what you care about. These are not things easily kind of conveyed by just having a goal. In the domain of inner development, I think there's a fundamental difference between goal and aspiration or goal and really vision. Vision is an expression of something that really matters to me. It might be an image of something I really wanna see achieved, but I, I really know in my heart that, that I don't know how to get there. That's another way to say this, to really embrace a goal or an aspiration in this inner world, we have to embrace profound uncertainty and let go of any illusion that we're in control, which is another way to say what I'm kind of getting at here. This, this inner development orientation invites us into a new way of operating where we have intentions and things we know matter to us. We really do want to see something occur, but we also recognize that we can't make it happen any more than we can make our children happy. So we know this lesson. We know that in a lot of areas of our life, the things that matter most, we might have clear intentions. We might have values that really are something that mean a great deal to us, but we can't make them happen. We can help allow them to happen, but we can't make them happen. And to me, that's all kind of wrapped up 
in this inner development goal. Let me just kind of be a little more concrete why I think the inner development orientation is important. I'm going to use climate change to illustrate. Climate change is a gift of sorts. Obviously, it creates great suffering. Very few people would see it as a gift. But you know, the science of climate change is not complicated. At some level, it's about gases accumulating in the atmosphere at levels that they haven't been for 20 million years in many ways. Um, and, and then because of that, we can actually see something fairly concrete. We know our culture is the problem. Our way of living is not something that we can continue. But now for the first time, we can say, oh, and by the way, in the next decade, these are some things that need to happen. Oh, and by the way, in the next 30 years, these are some things that need to happen. And by the end of the century, here's what we need to get. Um, climate change is gonna be an extraordinarily difficult journey. Wrestling with it is gonna have a lot of setbacks. So you know, if we did everything amazingly well for the next five to 10 years, which is a crucial decade, no doubt about it, this decade is crucial. Temperatures are gonna to continue to rise for at least the next 30 or 40 years. Things are gonna get worse. So we better have a way of calibrating progress, not just by getting to you know, 1.5 degrees C or two degrees C, you know, given the inertia, forget about the social system, just the inertia in the physical system. We're two, we've been at two degrees C for a long time. There's nothing we can do to stop that because the gases have accumulated in the atmosphere. And even if emissions drop so much that we're, quote, carbon neutrality, the goal that people are starting to appreciate by uh, uh, 2050, I think that's, that's a good goal. The greenhouse gas concentration is still way higher than it's been for many hundreds of thousands of years. Temperatures will continue to rise. So one implication of all that is, this is a journey of the century. If we do a really good job, We'll be working for this century on climate change. Two, we better be able to appreciate the process. We can't just get our satisfaction based on we are really starting to reverse climate change because we will not reverse climate change, really, this century. So the journey must be one that's valuable itself. That's to me another way to get at why these interdevelopment goals are so important. We face immense imbalances in the world. These imbalances have been built over centuries. They will not be reversed in years, barely in decades. So the journey of reversing them, the journey of coming more into balance itself has to be something we can really value. Working together in pursuit of something we really care about, having a sense of real collaboration amongst our different nations, for example, which of course, none of us realistically have much now. That to me in itself would be really valuable over and above the fact that it's absolutely necessary to get our act together to kind of rebalance the global climate system. So that's one of the reasons these interdevelopment goals are also really important, not just because they make sense intuitively and they're personally meaningful to us, but because Without them, we can't start to value the journey that we're embarking on. We can only look at the outcomes. And it's the journey itself that will give us balance and coherence, ultimately. So although I haven't used the term, what I've been talking about for the last uh, few minutes is all about this systems thinking stuff. So I'll just make a few closing comments to kind of restate everything I've just said. So. I never like it when a word becomes so fashionable that everybody uses it. So then I think, you know, well, everybody's talking about systems and systems change and all that today. Maybe it's a good, just not use that word for a while because it loses meaning. When a word gets used a lot, it starts to lose meaning. So here's a slightly different way to say everything I've just said, but it's really underscoring the, the core essence of systems thinking. We've got to stop fooling ourselves. We've got to stop, stop putting band-aids on things. We have to really deal with the fact that there are deep issues. We do not know how to live well together. And a deeper structure of how we operate will have to change. We will have to have new values, new ways of go orienting ourselves. Uh, I don't know if GDP sticks around. All I know is that it's a crazy way to orient a society because it doesn't deal with the health and well being of the people individually and collectively. Well-being is an inherently systemic concept. 
you know, in the Western medicine, we've had this basic problem for a long time. We have no definition of health. We have no consensual definition of health in Western medicine. A lot of traditional medicine systems like Chinese medicine uh, actually are quite different. In traditional medicine, typically the definition of health is the ability to rebalance oneself. So how well can you heal? That's a very good operational definition of health. So in the same sense, you know, how we build health and well-being in our societies is not just a set of goals, it's how well can we heal ourselves. So the system's perspective is about thinking more deeply, trying to get beyond surface events, trying to appreciate that the inner and the outer are always connected, always connected. What's out there is out there because it started in here. And what's in here is being continually reinforced by what's out there. There is no inner and outer in some sense. There's just one wholeness. Look around you, anything that you can see in the artifacts in the room you're sitting in, see if you can find anything that didn't originate as somebody's thought at some point. So the inner and the outer are always connected. There is a wholeness that's inescapable in life. When we as a people started to not live in forests, not live on grasslands, gradually start to cultivate organized agriculture, and then gradually start to leave that to live in cities, it was a long journey of distancing ourselves from the inherent wholeness of the living world. An organism is healthy or not as an organism not because I've got you know, the best finger or the best liver. <laughs> I, I have a great heart. Unfortunately, everything around it doesn't work too well. It doesn't have any meaning. So health and well-being by their nature are about the functioning of an organism, just as health and well-being at a collective level are about the functioning of communities and societies, families, communities, societies. So Systems thinking is inviting us to step back into what I consider our natural way of thinking. We've had a lot of experience teaching tools of systems thinking to children. They get it immediately. It takes very little time. They can, the only problem in a school setting is they learn so much faster than their teachers. The teachers then get very threatened. We grow up in families. We play on playgrounds. We live in communities. We are submer emerged as naturally in a world of interconnectedness. All that systems thinking is about is honoring the interconnectedness and the fact that everything is continually in a process of change. Those are the two pillars of systems thinking. It's all interrelated and it's all continually changing. Guess what? Every kid by the age of four or five knows this. They may or may not think it, but they know it. So it's a very natural way of thinking. It then orients us towards multiple time highs. We look at problems like climate change, or sustainability, we do have to think in the short term. This decade is really crucial. But then we have to think in the medium term. The time to now to 2050 is really crucial. But you know what? So too is the rest of this century. I'm just illustrating now. Systems thinking naturally gets us embracing the equal importance of multiple time frames and how they interact. In many ways regarding climate change, I think our big challenges will be from 2030 to 2050. If we start to make real progress, to slow the growth of global emissions, guess what? It's gonna get more and more threatening for a lot of vested interests. And those threats will grow over the next 20 or 30 years. So it's about embracing multiple timeframes. And in the end, it is really about honoring the inner and the outer. Hence a long circuitous way to say why I think the inner development goals are so important. You need both the inner and the outer are entwined, profoundly interdependent, never otherwise. It's just a delusion to think that's not true. We cannot build an organization that can really be creative in terms of its products and its services if we cannot create an environment in that organization where people feel they are creative, they are contributing. I know this will be something we'll be kind of returning to in just a minute. So I'm just using organizations now to illustrate that. The inner and the outer, the culture, the climate of the organization and what it produces and achieves are in inevitably connected. So that's another way to say this whole journey. Systems awareness is essential to inner development goals because it's reminding us that we can't realistically expect to make any progress 
on the sustainable development goals without attending with equal importance to the journey of our own personal and interpersonal change. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Wow, a lot to reflect on there. Um, I'm just gonna actually give us a few seconds before I move into a conversation with Michael to just let what's been shared sort of settle in and percolate. And just notice what it's stimulating in you and evoking in you questions and thoughts and sensations, what's been offered. And also just bringing our awareness to the fact we're in this incredible group of people from all around the world. It's pretty amazing. So sensing into the field, the virtual field. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna kick off here. So Michael and I are gonna connect for a few minutes, and then we can move into a three-way interaction. Um, but I want to just start with Michael sharing what's come up for me in relation to um our work together so one of the things that i think we, many of us recognize is one when you're in an organization that has like a bit that when you're in a business in particular and you've got tremendous pressure to you know meet bottom line to you know just fulfill the very real world um, pressures, exigencies of a business context. And now we have added on to that what I perceive a pressure cooker effect of now you've got the goals, the targets, the regulation, the SEC is now saying we're going to be tracking you. And, you know, it just creates a very pressurized environment. And as Peter just acknowledged, what happens when the, the stakes go up, you know, paradoxically, our anxieties can go up, right? And the fear can go up. And then what can happen is we lose uh, access to these capabilities, the, the being, the thinking, the relating, and we can get pushed into uh, action, action, action. And there's a lot of impatience within the business community, particularly that I experience as we don't have time for that. We don't have time for that. And it, it, it's really, truly a challenge. <laughs> and so um, I would love to hear your thoughts on that, like given where you're situated and how you're navigating in your world, um, how are you, you know, how are you approaching this endeavor of of engaging in real time messy systems change? Yeah. I think that it starts for me, and I think for many in our organization, is ultimately embracing ambiguity and thinking through how might you leap through complexity. What really struck me, what Peter said, is ultimately being able to embrace multiple time horizons. And you know, I think every organization is unique. We have unique, aspect, unique aspects as well. Our organization has a very long-term focus and wants to make a positive impact in the world. So we're in this for the long haul. And I think what we're being asked to do is not just about this next quarter, but is about the decades to come. Let me give you very concrete examples. Our organization has committed to only use carbon-free energy 24-7 by 2030. So it's a response to the urgency of what is ahead of us. But in order to achieve that, there is quite a bit of work to be done between now and then. And what I think is so interesting based on what Peter said is, is that you can really break it out into the here and now and what is yet to come. If I think about a goal like 24-7 carbon free energy for an organization like ours, we operate in over 60 countries around the world. It sounds like an easy commitment to make, but when you ultimately impact a little bit more, but you will find it is either a complicated problem or a variety of complicated problems all over the world, which makes it complex. And the way I deal with that is then to think through, well, 
what are the unknowns? Where do you have an area or at least a nudge of what a solution might be? And what are truly the unknowns? And from the knowns perspective, the time horizon is truly about the here and now. There are a lot of things we do where we already do only use carbon free energy. How can we accelerate the spreading of that? How can we do it faster? That is really about the here and now. Then we have a variety of areas where actually we have proof points. We want to pilot more, scale it up, and then ultimately roll it out at scale and move it into the ongoing operations. And then you have to accept and embrace as well that for a part of what we need to get done by 2030, there are no solutions as of today. And I think you have to acknowledge that. You have to embrace it and to say between now and 2030, we have eight years left to figure out how might you use carbon-free energy in countries where it's not available yet, or where the infrastructure is just not in place or actually consistently operating yet. So to me, it is ultimately being able to lead with a clear vision of where you want to go longer term, to acknowledge that you work in a very complex ecosystem where you have competing pressures. Some of our stakeholders feel we should do more faster. Others say you have to be very methodical. And I think as a leader of a program or a part of this ecosystem, you have to acknowledge and embrace this diversity of opinion. And then you have to think through how can you ultimately get as many of those individuals in your broader ecosystem? How can you enable them to ultimately work together towards this common goal? The other one that really struck me with what Peter was talking about, are inner development goals ultimately goals? Or is it much more a direction of competency, competency development? So the way I would use the inner development goals framework, to me, it is an amazing overview of 23 competencies that team members collectively should be able to master. The other one that really that struck me is that if you agree that we're working in a very complex ecosystem, is it really about the individual or is it about the individual in connection with the team, in connection with the broader ecosystem? And to me, it should have to be more than just the inner development goals because which is, I think, very focused on an individual. But at the same time, we need to acknowledge from, but what is the relationship of the skills of an individual in relationship to the broader ecosystem? Right. It's almost like the psychosocial development goals, <laughs> which doesn't quite have the same ring as inner, but it's the it's to the point Peter's making, there actually is no separation between the inner, the outer, you know, the consciousness and what's materially in our world. And it's a construct, right? And so in a way, I think these frameworks, that's all frameworks are, they are helpful constructs but they're never going to be perfect, right? They're always going to be um, sort of close, but but an approximation to reality, which is a system, and it and by its very nature, hard to take that and put it into a a really beautiful framework like the one we have with the IDGs. Yeah, and then one of the things that I'm just still, you know, learning more about is. Is the expectation, or are we going to set this belief that each individual should ultimately be able to master the 23 in the development goals? Or is it more or less like it is an amazing overview of what ultimately a system, a co collective, should jointly be able to work on, address, or master, versus just to create this expectation that each individual will become this amazing unicorn? and that you're able to master the five broad categories and then digging into all these different elements. Right. I, um, I like the way that you're framing this as competencies that um, reflect the totality, but not necessarily uh, what each human being can master. And the way that I relate with those SDGs and the five tracks, the five tracks and the 23 competencies um, is it, it feels to me very much like a menu or a, oops, a, um, a map. It's a map. 
and in an ideal scenario, I think it could be used as a almost like a reflection tool to assess kind of where one is at. But in order to engage in that, we need a map of the landscape. You know, it's sort of like um, some of you may be familiar with Project Inside Out, which is a resource um, that was developed over the past couple of years to provide some mapping of what does it mean to lead in this space? You know, we want to think about how we show up. You know, are we showing up as kind of preaching at people? Are we guiding? Are we enabling? I think that, um, you know, what are our theories of change? Are we focused on messaging or emotional engagement or technical, you know, innovation, technical innovation? Um, I think the IDGs, that competency is kind of a similar um, thing. And I'd be curious to hear, Michael, um, you know, if you have thoughts around, again, bringing it back to the fact that there isn't a lot of time and space. That's the paradox is we need some time and space to be able to reflect and engage and develop and grow. And I also really would like to hear Peter's perspective on this. How do you create the, that within the context that you are working in? And I should say before you respond, Michael, for those who just joined and missed the introduction, Michael Bacher is VP of Global uh, Programs and Workplace Services at Google, oversees a massive portfolio of amenities and operations that would just blow your mind if you, if you could process it. So there's real like, you are in it, Michael, you are in it, you have to be overseeing a high level of implementation execution on a daily basis. So how do you imagine kind of bringing this in, um, in light of that? Yeah. Now, for me, it starts with the definition of a complex problem. So for me, a, a complex problem is a problem that is very, very difficult to define if you can define it at all. And there are no well-defined solutions either. So for me, it's much more about steering the ship guiding into a direction and then acknowledging that so many of your passengers are on various different phases of their journey as well. So I have less of this longing where, it need, where you, this longing of, I need to get the people on the, board, on, ship, on the ship from at least point one to point B versus much more about directing people onto, we need to become better at communicating. We need to get, become better at sensing we need to become better at embracing complexity and then acknowledging that people have a very different starting point, might have actually different abilities to get further. And you create this enablement ecosystem where people ultimately are able to come along individually or supported by others. So mm -hmm. you have that. And I think at the same time, I think as individuals or as leaders, you have the ability and I think the, the, the responsibility to guide your part of the ecosystem to what you believe is truly important. And I think there is probably a tension in that system as well, because there are so many, many challenges that needs to be addressed. But I do believe, and that's my personal conviction, that you make more impact by focusing on fewer things and to do more or do fewer things better and faster. And with that, you have to embrace as well as others who would make a different or come to a different prioritization might ultimately push you back on your prioritization as well. But I do believe that ultimately thinking through there are a thousand problems to be addressed. For our organization, we might agree to do the first five, not denying the remaining 995, but basically say, we're going to focus on the first five and to figure out how might we support others to work collectively on the other 995. So I do think that ultimately it's a combination of focus, growing the capabilities and the competencies of ultimately the ecosystem that you're a part of, um, celebrating successes and acknowledging that you'll have many, many failures on your journey as well. Because if you don't have failures, you're very likely not pushing hard enough Mm hmm. So I want to reflect a little bit before inviting Peter into the conversation. So one, um, 
your invocation of enablement is actually extremely important. So I want to I want to highlight that here that um, framing this work as how do we enable, how do we cultivate the conditions um, is really, I think, what this is about. And that's a that's a shift away from a way of thinking that's been dominating the space, especially in kind of sustainability, climate, so forth, which has been about driving change, or it's been about um, making people care. You know, the enablement frame is actually profound. So I want to acknowledge that. And I also, um, I don't, I don't want to embarrass you, but I, <laughs> I want to just acknowledge that. Uh, I'm going to speak in the second person for a minute. So. What Michael is demonstrating here um, as a leader is actually rare. This is a very rare mindset, um, which is acknowledging um, the, the imperfection that we don't know all the answers, that there's high levels of uncertainty, that there's a level of humility. And that in itself is an, an, an embodiment of what I see as a form and kind of leadership that we're really wanting and needing today, that the IDGs are in service of. So I want to acknowledge you, Michael, for that, that um, and, and express appreciation for how you're showing up um, in the context of such pressure. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of an ease and a grace that I marvel and I, I'm really fascinated to know how we can we can encourage more of that sort of existential ease with the uncertainty, you know, because the phrase I've heard you use for several years now is the, we have longing for clarity, we have longing for certainty. Um, my, uh, Peter just acknowledged that, you know, we have to just give that up, right? We have to let go of the longing. And we need people in leadership roles, I think, to to acknowledge that and to affirm that and give us permission to. Um, but you know, it, it, it marvel. I, I I'm just like, where does that sense of ease come from? Because for a lot of people, it, we can get popped out of our kind of threshold, right, and get very anxious and very kind of our stakes can go up with given the the situation yeah. we're in. So I would answer the question in the following way. So if you want to be impactful in the world, and if you really say, I acknowledge the challenges that we are faced with, and I want to leave the world in a better place, whether it's for my kids, or what, whatever ultimately is driving you to do what you want to do. To me, it's so incredibly straightforward, is that if I have clarity on what it is I or our organization does not know and where we need help. Wouldn't you be able to impact more by being clear about it and asking others for help mm -hmm. and getting others to do the work for and with you and make it more, more impact than for you just to be, I would say, somewhat oblivious or ignorant and to say, I'm just going to pretend that by the time I, I'm done on planet Earth, I've only achieved 40% versus what you can do by just being open about what you don't know and very likely what others don't know either. But it is this belief of, I would love for anybody to help us to achieve what we need to do. I have no pride in ultimately the solution in itself. I think there should be proud, pride in being able to get more done with others. Mm -hmm. um, so, but you have to, go ahead. Go finish your thought. But I think it's ultimately, it goes back to the context in which you get to work. It's mm -hmm. probably the context of your culture. So it's, it's easy maybe for me to say, and maybe I'm just lucky to have found an organization where this way of thinking is really embraced um, and where you ultimately get to act upon that. But it goes back to my belief as well is that ultimately you own it. It's easy just to be part of, you know, the, the average middle of the organization because it's easier. There is no risk. Nobody's going to call you out for over, overstepping boundaries or being too much out there. So there is a little bit of you need to have this inner drive as well. Um, and then you have to act on it. Yeah. 
So uh, just want to acknowledge that <laughs> someone who's been on the front lines of working with organizations for years, especially climate and sustainability organizations, that uh, mindset you're expressing is very rare, very rare. You know, a lot of leaders, and especially in the sustainability and climate space, I'm going to say something provocative, um, can lack humility and can lack openness. I see that as a defense mechanism against feeling like I can't allow myself to go there. I have to show up as like having that sense of I know what I'm doing. But I can tell you, Michael, that it's very it's it's unusual for me to find leaders who um, are t especially uh, tasked with overseeing major initiatives. Um, and I'm not going to name any names here, but people out in the public who it's like have a really hard time going there with the humility and actually being truly open to that's really interesting. I'm curious. You know, I'd like to learn more. This is fascinating. Bring it on. It's like, come maybe, on, you know, it's maybe rare. You're making, maybe you're making a good argument now, Renee, for why the interdevelopment goals are so important. Yes. I would say everything you've just said is a good illustration of someone who doesn't have much of a commitment to their own development. Because if you're committed to your own development, it's profoundly humbling. <laughs> you, realize, right. you realize how limited you are. You know, it, it's easy to say all these things, but if you really, you know, there's an old saying in traditional uh, Chinese culture that a mark of every really good person is they're very tough on themselves. And I don't mean that in the sense of beating themselves up, but they, they, they really are grounded in continually assessing that, no, I really didn't listen to that person. I, I, I kind of looked like I was listening, but really I was so caught up in my own thoughts, I heard very little of what they saw. I mean, to be committed to inner development, it puts you on an inescapable journey of, of being humbled. So I think another way to say what you just said is, well, good, we don't have many leaders and many, we have a lot of people in positions of authority who don't have much notion of what it means to be committed to their own development. So I, I think that's a, it's a very, you know, it, it's obviously an opinion that you have. And I think it, it, it certainly corresponds to some degree of mine, but I'll tell you, most of the people I've had the privilege to work with are a lot like Michael. Mm -hmm. They're the only ones who get anything done on complex issues. The people who have a big ego and think they've got a plan that's going to work. I'll never forget. I had a, a, a good mentor of mine go and visit the CEO, but I said, this guy needs a little coaching. And I'll never forget his comment. He came back to me and said, well, I've talked to him. He has a very clear plan of where he wants to go. He's in big trouble. And, and he realized that this guy was so caught up in his goals and his way of getting there that he would just, you know, never be able to deal with the complexity that he would actually face. And he was right. Within a couple of years, he was gone. He, mm -hmm. he, just, he was way too focused on his own way of seeing the world. So humility might be another kind of overarching kind of way of appreciating what the hell the inner development goals are actually all about. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I, I can't work with people who don't have that openness. Yeah. I, we can't. It's not possible. There's no traction there. So I've given that up a long time ago, and I just go with where, you know, where the receptivity is, but I, I do think it's worth reflecting on how can we, again, going back to enablement, how do we enable the conditions that cultivate our capacities to truly stay, be present? And this, this does relate to your work, Peter, um, a lot, is, is the conditions that uh, enable us to be, stay with the uncertainty, to stay with the unknown, without going into the tactic, the tactic, the tactic, the language of action, the got to get this done and that. And I and Michael, you you know, I know that you're really sitting at that um, that tension as well, right? Is how do we what are those conditions that allow us to slow down enough so that we can go fast? Let's ask a question to the two of you. So you, Renee, you are truly thinking through theories of change and actually how do you drive change? And then Peter obviously is a master in system thinking. So why do the two of you believe that the IDGs are gonna make a difference this time around? So what will be different this time around versus a cynic who would say this will pass too as so many things in the passive change as well. 
And obviously, I'm not saying that with this belief that I believe they will not be extremely helpful, but what is your core belief of why you believe it's this difference this time around, especially as the stakes are so high? Mm -hmm. um, shall I take that first, Peter? Mm -hmm. um, well, first, I like the question and the framing of belief. Um, I'm sort of on a kick right now where it really comes down to what we believe. Like our beliefs are what inform reality, right? So, <clears throat> so I'm appreciating that framing. Um, I believe that the IDGs are uh, impactful and have real traction for, I would say, three reasons. You know, one, the clarity, the clarity of the communication. So let's let's not forget that the IDGs were designed and and the brainchild in part by um the Jacob um who um I'm forgetting his last name you can put it in the chat but the 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 folks that created the SDG visual language right where th there was a ch a challenge of how do we translate these SDGs visually into a global language that that's who's behind this so there's power here and deep thought into the translation and the representation and that matters like we are visual beings we need things to be clear and compelling so there's the visual language and the branding of idg which for many of us who've been working on this for many many years is is just so easy and it's so clear so there's that two is the moment we're in then the context we're in we are in a very different moment and context than we were last year, two years ago, three years ago, where we're witnessing an explosion of hunger and interest in uh, capability, development, learning, learning academies, accelerators, um, because of necessity, because there's pain and there's a sense of our technical approaches are not going to get us where we need. And we're hearing that the technical won't get us where we need to go. I'm hearing it for the first time by people in very senior level positions who have platforms. So that's number two. Um, and number three, I think um, it goes back to the power of reflective tools, not prescriptive. This is not a prescription. This is a reflective tool. And the reason why that's so powerful and important is because ultimately no one is going to be able to tell us exactly what to do and how to translate these. And I know we all want that. I'm asked almost every day, how are you gonna operationalize these IDGs? Well, you know my style, Michael, I'm gonna turn it right back on you. And I'm gonna say, what do you think? Because you know what? I believe that you know. I believe in the insight and the wisdom within each human. And I believe that when we create those capacities to bring that out, that's when we actually get somewhere is not someone coming along and saying here's the formula and here's the prescription i think those are really good points i uh, i couldn't agree with you more that um you know we're, we're conditioned we're educated our organizations are highly kind of skillful at technical problem solving and gradually you kind of wake up and go yeah the only one small problem <laughs> these are not technical problems um, and the the effort to try to continue to reduce them to technical problems. I mean, look, we could we could have been accelerating the energy transition 50 years ago. I remember being part of a project, you know, even 25, 30 years ago, where there was a big challenge grant to all the big Detroit auto companies to build a car in an assembly line. Actually, it was 1990, 1988 to 1990, to build a car in an assembly line that could get 80 miles per gallon, and they did it. And then none of them thought to bring it to market. So the problems, the technical parts of these problems are simple. The, the organizational, institutional, and you might say cultural inertia is what we always bump up against. So I think you're absolutely right about that. And in that context, obviously, seeing the IDGs as tools for reflection rather than prescription, really mm -hmm. important. I'm watching the time, and I, I know we yeah. wanted to give people some time to, to get into a breakout, and I think we probably should transition to that pretty soon. Definitely. I agree. I just wanted to add a little bit, uh, a, a slight take on what you just said about inertia. I think it's important. I This is my belief that it's 
less inertia and it's more defense mechanism. So it's how organizations manage anxiety. So I'm thinking again about, let's just take Google because we've got Michael here. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's how an organization kind of copes with anxiety, you know, varies by the culture, right? But I think what shows up as, as inertia or what shows up as we don't have time for that in itself is a defense mechanism or a defense strategy. Would you agree? Yeah, and I think the capabilities to ultimately interact with a group who you disagree with, I think is becoming a more critical skill as well. Because we're now in an environment where if I disagree with you, I will go all out to prove that you're not, and then you fill in whatever terms you want to use. And I think it is how do you ultimately create an environment again where we can actually have a normal conversation and we can agree to disagree. So I think that is a big part as well. And I think the other one is ultimately to just to be able to agree to disagree. Because that's the other one. It's We try to be so incredibly inclusive and we have this, I think, false belief that everybody can have their own beliefs I don't think it's going to work. It doesn't work as of today. So you have a variety of things happening concurrently. And I think the way people deal with that are organizations by just ignoring the issue because it's truly hard to deal with the issue in itself. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I, think, I think it was Benjamin Franklin who said, disagreement never, agreement, agreement never produced any real progress in human affairs. All progress comes from disagreement. So what does it take to embrace that spirit, which is not a new idea? You know, that disagreement is the energy for real change because it's conflict and conflict is actually can be very constructive. Again, these are capacities. I think Michael is absolutely right. It's one thing to say what I just said. It's another thing to actually be good at doing it. And that's the difference, you know, in, in really a capacity building orientation, which I think in many ways is what businesses can could be best at. Really working organizations provide the laboratories in which people can build real capacities. Because if you, you, you don't have the capacity, you just have the idea, you don't accomplish much. And these are ultimately pragmatic institutions that survive and thrive based on what they accomplish. So it really they really need capacities. Um, so here's, we knew this conversation would take us in a lot of different directions and it would have a kind of natural characteristic of of a, of a diverging conversation. We wanted to give you a little time to just reflect on, on what you're hearing. And then we'll move into a breakout. So uh, I'll set it up now because I know we're, we're short on time. So um, first off, take a minute or so and just notice what's one thing you heard, or it could be two or three, that really struck you as very important for you and your own work. I mean, at some level, we learn when we make a connection to something we're doing. It could be a project you're working on. It could be something that you're very engaged with in your organization, amongst organizations. But just one or two things that stood out for you. And in just a minute, you'll be in a breakout. And I'd like you to do a check-in where you actually hear from each person. So you go around the circle, let each person say a word or two about what really struck them, what stood out for them. And then start to, you'll see the kind of diversity of things. Obviously it'll be very different for different people. And, and the key to doing this in a way that's effective is to kind of slow down first. That's why when we stop, we won't go into the breakout immediately. We just give a minute or two to give you a chance to pause. Take a deep breath, notice what's really moving in you. And then when you're in the breakout, Start by hearing from each person. Now, given the number of people and the timing, it'll be, you know, think about like a minute each. So you actually hear from each person. And then you'll have a little more time after that to just to continue the conversation. The key to making this sort of little practice work is very simple. It's all in the listening. Mm -hmm. So as you're listening to each other, just notice, you know, your genuine openness or your intent to be genuinely open to just be with this person, hear what they have to say, and then the next, and the next, and the next, till you've gotten around the circle. And then you should have a few minutes in addition, just to chat. We'll be bringing you back in about, uh, about 10, 12 minutes. 
Um, but just before we go into the breakout, yes, we just, just give us another, you know, 30 seconds or so, just for the pause. What's really striking me about this conversation? So Jesper, whenever you're ready, you can move them into the breakouts. And remember about one minute each, so you hear from each person first, and then you'll have a little extra time to just continue the conversation. Thank you. One, one takeaway, Peter, that I had from this, and Michael one, one and away, Peter, that I had from this, and Michael and also from all your conversations, conversations is when you're talking uh, about the like development skills being uh, like qualities of an ecosystem, or, or whatever, I think rather than individual really skills or qualities or whatever. I think that's it's a really the clarity important which notion, that with, and it's uh, that the clarity out. which you've uh, conveyed in, uh, that with. We haven't had that out so far. So thank you very much. I thought Michael really hit a critical uh, point right on the head at the beginning when he said, you know, this is not just about individuals and inner people. Mm -hmm. It's just that, but it doesn't have to. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the quality of this inner space shared in a team is like how you start mm -hmm. to understand what makes a generative team. So I think recognizing mm -hmm. that inner does not mean individual only. Mm -hmm. Really important. Mm -hmm. So we have closed the rooms. And so people are coming we back. Have to close the room. Well, while those of you who are back, the, our idea for this closing is to start off with just a little time to use the chat to, sh to write anything you would like of what kind of came out in the breakouts. So obviously, we don't have anywhere near enough time to hear from a lot of different people, which would be ideal. But this is a kind of a close approximation. Just in the chat, write whatever you'd like that was really stirred up for you in that breakout or in the session. For those of you who are still just coming back, we're just having a little time to let people share in the chat anything they would like from the day and their breakout. to see the reflections <clears throat> wonderful That's something that's um, direct transmission. I don't know, you, Renee, but I'm finding myself torn. It's so much fun just reading these that I kind of hate to start talking. Yeah, I agree.
So we, we have a few kind of announcements at the very end. So we need to reserve about five minutes for that. Um, again, I think these chat comments are, are just wonderful. And I'll just make my closing comment by saying, you know, we, reading them gives me a, a wonderful sense of the kind of collective reflection that's going on. And it's a beautiful embodiment of the fact that inner is not just individual. Michael, Renee, any kind of closing comments? Um, For me, it is a, um, a journey. And we will know more tomorrow than we know today. Mm. And it's really about doing, iterating, and give yourself, I would say, grace for the things that you try and do, and not be a self critic that always says, I'm not doing enough or it's not good enough. Um, it's be kind to yourself. Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure I have much to add to that. Uh just appreciation recognition that development is hard <laughs> that you know doing developmental work is challenging and just acknowledging that honoring that having compassion for ourselves and each other as we bring this work out in the world so yeah, yeah. appreciation for the time that everyone's taken and for yeah. the conversation it's hard because it's actually hard, not because we're incompetent. <laughs> yes, that's correct. <laughs> so turn it back to Johan Fatima, and I know Renee has an announcement or two at the end also. Do you want to go first, Renee? Sure. Um, I just wanted to let folks know, um, just acknowledging there's a lot of people outside of the U.S. on the call. Um, that there's some activity happening that's pretty cool to kind of start bringing IDGs more into the US context. And one of those is a conference coming up um, called Sustainable Brands. It's a corporate, it tends to be more of a corporate sustainability community and platform. And I'm gonna just throw a couple of links in the chat just to let you know that Michael Bacher is gonna be doing a keynote. Um, and I'm gonna be doing a keynote as well, talking about the IDGs with um with christina um namela strom from ikea so i'm just going to put those in want to put that on the radar i wanted to also acknowledge project inside out as a tool and a platform that is about reflection i saw that coming up in the responses uh, and i'll put that in the chat again for anyone who wants to check that out okay thank you very much um, the last few minutes, we, we're going to listen. Uh, Jan, are you there? Our CEO of the IDGs, he's going to uh, tell us a bit about what's uh, happening next. Well, thank you for a beautiful and rich conversation. We are a group of people, a little IDG hub here at the island of uh, Equaret. If we can wa wave behind me. The... Oh my gosh. Whoa. <laughs> so cool. Uh, just wanted to say, uh, Peter, Rene, Michael, thanks so much for your wisdom. I really hope we can see you here at the island in September 2023, when we will gather uh, again. Uh, a reflection first, just in our three, we talked about the skill of being OK or at ease with uncertainty. It's funny that in Swedish, we, we couldn't even find a name for it. The closest that I could find is negative capability that John Keith referred to when reading Shakespeare's dramas and saying how that builds an ability to hold uncertainty and uh, cognitive dissonance and how we need a word. And we don't even have a language for some of the skills most needed. Uh, so just a reflection upon that. Uh, what I'd like to invite you to is three events that are happening next. Uh, the first one we just decided upon, and it's about embodying the new development goals and embodying them through art, 
and poesy and music. So we're gonna be four artists, musicians and poets gathering on the 14th of June at Ekferet co-working space. And we're gonna send it uh, also online. But if you want to participate, you need to do something like we're doing. You need to find at least two friends. So you need to be three people sitting at one computer if you want to join. And we're gonna have beautiful contributions of music and art and poetry. And we're gonna work with our bodies and feel and with that uh, so that it not just becomes an intellectual uh, exercise. The second thing is actually the day after. It's our partner, Kadra, Cognitive Adult Development uh, Science from Research to Application. They will do a half day uh, on um, dialectical thinking. And you can join that. There will be information on how space. You will get uh, information sent out to you about it also. And the last thing is actually we're doing a first IDG Action Day in the United States, uh, in Austin. And we hope we can, uh, please help us get Brittany Brown. She's from Austin. We need to get her involved. We need to get her to the island also. So 27th of um, June, Thomas Bjorkman, uh, the founder of the Eckhart Foundation and myself will be in Austin. Uh, we will be there with Daniel Schmachtenberger, with um, uh, Tristan House and many others who will be gathering for a small um, conference. And on Monday the 27th, there will be a half day uh, IDG Action Day from the US, the first ever in US. So you're welcome to join that. Uh, and the last call out is uh, we, we will start our phase three, which is going global in the, with the IDGs. And on the 20th of September, uh, Barry School of Communication will be hosting half a day for partner organizations like Google. Uh, thank you, Michael, for bringing Google into this work, uh, like, Alpha, like Spotify and many others. Uh, and for all of you uh, with companies behind you, see if you can get your organization on board or start the process and maybe we can meet on the 20th of September. This is where we need the most help is to uh, be able to continue to fund this journey and it's done through organizations and institutions help us bring more organizations and institutions to this. Thank you all for participating and being here. Thanks for your wisdom and sharing in the chat. And thank you all who participated in the feedback session that we had just a week ago uh, at the post-summit feedback session. So thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, this is the last gathering for this spring. Uh, and if you are not already signed up on our newsletter on the website, there's going to be a link uh, where you go. Uh, please do, because we have a list of very exciting <laughs> gathering topics for this autumn. So please join us uh, then. And thank you for today. And Yuan. Yes, as an end, why don't we all turn on our microphones and we say goodbye, or yeah, goodbye in our own language as an end. Thank you. Gracias. Gracias. Bye. 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 B